So I'd like to ask a question about what you said regarding um, the natural predisposition toward worshiping something. Yes. And you mentioned um, like Stalinist Russia and Communist China, which you know, are, you know, I'm not sure is the best example considering those are usually described as being sort of like personality cults. Like. Sure. So my question is, you know, how do you distinguish between a religion, a cult? and faith or spirituality. Because nowadays we hear people saying that, oh, I'm not religious, but I am spiritual, but I believe in a higher power, but I don't necessarily believe in one organized religion. So how you know. That's a good question. I agree with you. Maybe that was not the best example. Um, so yeah, uh, that I will take that as, a, as an uh, advice that I will put into effect and, and implement in the future. If I have this talk again, that is. Uh, in regards to this technical question, I would say I really don't want to um, delve deeper into the idea of how, I mean, you know, we know that religion is associated with the term organized. It's what people call organized religion. And once you have a form of spirituality, then the, the question now becomes technical from a linguistic point of view. Is this a religion in a sense or a person being spiritual? Because it's a very broad topic. I would prefer to just give you the Islamic simplification of this whole thing, which is there should be no distinction between all of these terms because they should all lead us to one fact. And that is that human beings are physical and spiritual beings who need a law. Because if we were created by God, then he is absolutely the most qualified to give us a law by which we live. If there was no law, there would be chaos. And spiritual beings, those who claim to be spiritual, can commit the most abhorrent crimes in the name of their spirituality. And so then how do you now, you're going to tarnish the image of all religions because of spiritual individuals who are doing things that are unethical, for example. And they're saying, I'm a spiritual type of person. We say, we, we, you know, you're going to go in a maze and you will never get out. The bottom line is, the religion, the religion should be one. And that religion should serve the matters of the spiritual growth and prosperity and the physical law under which we live. And the umbrella that covers all of that is compassion, justice, love, you know, and the human beings being able to deal with each other in a manner that eliminates hatred and, and infighting and so on and so forth. If they were to allow the rules to govern, but because human beings are disobedient by default, uh, by, or not by default, many of them choose to be disobedient, then we have this type of chaos. Now, I don't know if I answered your question, but again, it's a, it's a technical thing, and I just gave you the simple Islamic answer in my perception, Wallahu alam. Not necessarily, but okay. <laughs> can you just shout? It's fine, you can ask for the mic so that everyone can hear the question. You're shy. Yeah, you can write it down as well. Did he go from I, I want to shout to I'm shy? <laughs> Wait, let me shout in front of everybody. Hey, what's going on? I got a question. Wait a second, I'm shy. <laughs> let me write it down. That just doesn't work, buddy, but it's okay. Zakla khair. Still waiting? Question? <laughs> I've read from one hour and a half of questions yesterday to only one question today. They ran out yesterday. <laughs> Need to refill.
reading it correctly. So the question says, your ideas on your ideas under enlightenment, such as Go ahead. Yeah, it's better to use the mic. Yeah. Okay, I just want to ask, what's your ideas on enlightenment, in terms of enlightenment? Because Hindus, uh, Buddhists, they believe in enlightenment, moksha, nirvana. Mm. What's your ideas about that? What do you say about that? Because that's the peak of spirituality. You were talking about there's no such thing as like, you know, uh, organized religion or something. We are physical beings and spiritual beings, something like that, right? Yes. But I would say religions are totally, they are diverse things from spiritual, whatever that spiritual the core is. And, and Hinduism and Buddhism, they say it's more about enlightenment. They say it's more about enlightenment. What's your idea about that? Maybe I'm not in a position to speak about them if I don't know exactly the definition of enlightenment in Buddhist and Hindu uh, you know, concepts or in their own terminology. Uh, we, I mean, as Muslims, we have the concept of enlightenment, uh, which we call as a, a type of, uh, you know, it's more like an inspiration, I would say, that a person becomes God conscious to the point that they're guided by God to see certain things. Nothing supernatural. We don't want to get, you know, into that other realm of things. But the ability to see through falsehood. Because we believe the relationship with God is dynamic. It's not, it's not that there isn't a relationship. Each person has an individual relationship with the Creator. And the stronger this relationship is in devotion and worship, then God will supply this human being with certain skills, abilities, and the ability to see and distinguish between truth and falsehood. This is based on textual evidence from the Quran. I don't know if it's the same as the Hindu and the Buddhist. You can have the mic again if, if, if we're on different tracks here. really surprising because um, that is what exactly Buddhists and Hindus are talking about also like you know you are trying to be one with the God you know uh, taking away the falsehood the destroying the ego uh -huh. the so my question is another question that just right if all these religions and so called um, whatever the people are being teached around yes. if they are trying to implement the same idea why do we need like many religions and that's a beautiful question I've, I've, I'm glad you asked that because this is one of the topics or one of the items I usually discuss in a different lecture about the true religion of God. Because if you're right, if we were to open this door, then a Christian will tell you, well, the ghost, the Holy Ghost is guiding me. And who are you to tell me anything to the contrary? And then, you know, a Hindu will say a similar thing and a Buddhist will say a similar thing and a Jew and a Muslim, obviously. And then even a, a person who doesn't believe in anything says, I'm being guided by the spirits. So how do you distinguish that? Everybody's making the claim, and it's a pretty big claim. We say, uh, let me just, if I don't answer your question now, you can ask again, no problem. But maybe I've understood you. Either way, this is where we have another lecture, which is the true religion of God. I'm not going to use this inspiration as the yardstick by which I judge true truth uh, from falsehood. Because that becomes subjective. Your opinion, my opinion. Uh, so a Catholic is, is guided by the Holy Ghost and a Protestant and a Jehovah Witness among the Christians, but they don't agree on so many things. And which Holy Ghost is guiding which among them? Then the Muslims will have diff different denominations who will tell you, God is guiding me to, you know, uh, curse the, pro the, pro the companions. And the other one says, no, this is wrong. Again, you will find in each religion denominations, all of them making that claim of being inspired, yet they are bickering and differing amongst each other. The only way you resolve this is by laying down the criteria of the true religion of God. If we were to have this discussion, then I will attempt to prove to you that Islam is the only true religion. Therefore, any type of inspiration that is outside those boundaries is appreciated but rejected. Sure, sure. We can, if nobody else asks a question, we can go back to it. Because look, you, if, there's no solution for this. If all of, look, why do we have so many religions? If all the religions, the only way all religions can lead to God. Let's say, let, I keep my Islam, he keeps his Buddhism, she keeps her Hinduism, no issue. 
Everybody keeps his own religion and we all claim that we're going to God. The only way this is possible is if we all agreed who God is and if our religions were identical. On the ground, there aren't two religions on earth who agree who God is. And religion is about God. Let alone two identical religions in the full sense of the word. So now we have different destination. There's no way that each one of us is going to lead now to one unified destination when we already don't agree on the destination. My concept of God is unlike His. How are we going to go to the same God when His God is different than mine? So then you have to prove which one has the proper understanding of God. Based on what? He is going to use His scriptures. And I'm going to use my scriptures. Now let us look into these scriptures. Have your scriptures been distorted? Are they man-made? Are they written by human beings? Have they been revised? Are there different versions of them? If all of these apply, say sorry. With all due respect, you don't have the grounds upon which you can prove the validity of your claims. And then we, as, again, my, my lecture in the beginning, as Muslims, we have the ability to say, okay, come look into my scripture. If we were to apply all these rules, it passes all the tests. You know, it's like smog check. Before your car is allowed to you know, drive on the street, you go through a smog check. It's, it passes all the exams. The scripture, Quran, passes all the exams that in our opinion, other scriptures cannot pass. Once this is the case, that, that solves all the other issues. It, they get sorted out. Now, I know it's a difficult pill to swallow. But th that's what we believe. We like... I would read uh, some of the questions here, there are many of them. So I'll, I'll try to get the more relevant ones. So this person says, where should I start my investigation from? When investigating, what are the key points that I should keep in, that I should keep in consideration? And do I need to choose a true religion or can I choose any religion? Very good. Yes, to answer the, the latter part of the question, yes, you need to choose one true religion because with all due respect to all religions as i mentioned earlier they cannot possibly all lead to salvation because they don't agree they don't agree and then religion is a matter of god and if it's a matter of god then you have to learn about god from god if you're learning about god from human beings then you're you're subject to all types of discrepancies all types of inconsistencies which we see which we see within other religions without putting anyone down, you will see they cannot really agree who God is, how many forms He has taken, whether He came in human form or not, whether He is man or not, whether He is one, I mean, again, it's a, it's a very dynamic dogma. And if most people don't have the ability and the intelligence to digest it and understand it, then let alone explain it to others. When it comes to Islam, we have a very solid, very straightforward, very basic understanding of God. It doesn't, uh, there's no philosophy involved. And that is the next lecture, which is who is God. You will understand exactly what we believe. And I believe it's as, as transparent as any belief can be. Once that understood, then we have to, you have to have one religion. And once you have that one religion, where do you start? You, first you start with your heart. And you start by, if, you, if you're investigating, you, you, one of two people, either you investigate in the existence of God, then you have to start somewhere else, or you believe in God and you're investigating the true religion. If you believe in God and you're investigating the true religion, then the first thing is, connect your heart to God. Don't be independent. Don't you believe in God? Yes, I believe in God. Tell him, I'm confused. There's Islam, and it's very fishy nowadays. You know, Islam, I don't know, man, that's... That should be the last choice. The last choice I have. Islam. I mean, look at the Muslims all over the world. Look at the, you know, the violence. But in the name of Islam, everything happens, right? It's just sad, but it's true. It's true, I understand. So you might think, okay, put this at the bottom of the list. But that you cannot judge the religion by what's going on with the people or the media or the propaganda. That's not fair. It's not fair. So you have to understand that. As God, there's Islam, Christianity, Judaism. I mean, I don't know. Oh God, guide me. And I, we have full confidence that any human being who connects with God at this level shall be guided. If you're sincere, I don't even worry about you. You shouldn't even worry about yourself. You shall find the truth once you have connected with the Creator. 
And of course, it's not like you have a billion options. There aren't that many religions. And many of them, from the beginning, you can already figure out that something is completely wrong. You know what I mean? It's just something that is not worthy of your consideration. You don't want to you know, involve yourself with ideologies that are not religious-based, that minority of people have believed in over you know, p periods of time. The other option is that you don't believe in God. And then I would say, reflect upon your own self. Reach the point where you have confidence that you were not created by some coincidence, some chance, some random event that took place. That this is perfectly orchestrated. Everything in our lives is so perfectly orchestrated, it must be by the greatest power ever. And it must be by the creator of this creation. Because you are a creation. If you disagree, create your own creation. Go ahead. You don't like the system. Some people say, I don't like the system. I don't like the way things are happening. How come this? How come that? Why do these things happen? Why are the people dying from starvation? I don't know in which country. Why is there war? Why this? Why that? No problem. You don't like any of that. I, I, I feel you. Go ahead, my friend. Create your own heavens and earth. Create your own mankind and establish your own rules. Oh, wait, you can't do that. Well, welcome to the world then. Try to move with the rest. Huh? Just, just conform to the existing. Because we don't have the ability to make our own world. So it's, why waste time with all this argument? I would have done this. I don't like this about religion. Why does God have to do this? Why does God make women do this? Why did God make men do this? Don't, you're wasting your time. Either you make your own in a better way. And I would like to remind you that very often you are the same one who cannot multiply 855 by 743. Yes, I know you're thinking about it now and you don't have an answer. Pull out your calculator. Oh, you got an answer now. Oh, poor human being. Oh no, you're really capable of creating a better heavens and earth and a better system. You can't multiply three numbers by three numbers. That's just great news. So I mean, the human beings are arrogant. They don't realize what's going on. You can't even figure things out on your own. So how could you be better than God in the system he made? Just stop being silly and accept what's going on. Then you will have a peace of mind. And then move on. But if you're sincere, God will guide you. No doubt. Um, this takes us to the next question, which says, how can I believe in God when there's a lot of suffering in the past and nowadays, such as the Palestinian people? That's very easy. Because nowhere did God tell us that we are in paradise. In fact, He told us that we have been decreed to go down to this earth and struggle until you earn your spot back in paradise. Ya ayyuhal insanu inna kakadihun ila rabbika kadhan famulaqi. Oh, son of Adam, you will strive and struggle towards your Lord in the ultimate sense, and then you will eventually meet him. We have created mankind in turmoil, in, in, in difficulty. You are meant to struggle in this life. It is meant to have conflict. And the human beings taking advantage of other human beings, oppression, wrongdoing. Killing, violence. Why? Because all this will be sorted out on the day of recompense. How do you, how do you earn your spot in paradise? How do you pass your class? Doesn't the teacher have to make certain things, requirements? Certain homework, certain examination that you on an individual level strive to achieve and then you pass. You get your degree. If they just said anybody who comes to the class will graduate, it would be insane. Some of you will graduate as engineers and they can't even ride a bike. What is the, what is the relation between riding a bike and engineers? I don't know, I'm just saying. <laughs> it wouldn't be fair. Oh, doctor, good to see you. So, doctor, so uh, tell me something about which, well, I was missing all the classes. <laughs> Now we were partying the whole time in the coffee shop, man. This is, we had the great teacher. He said, no homework, no exams. Don't even come to class. Just pay your tuition. Yes, yeah, Sheikh, don't even pay your tuition. It's on me. 
I'll, I know the people in the financial department, they'll sort you out. After four years, it's on me. You'll become the best doctor in town. Go kill as many people as you want. <laughs> Open your own clinic. See, this is, this is unacceptable. So we human beings reject this idea. So then people wonder Palestinian conflict, this, that, conflict. How do you think people wind up earning paradise? Sometimes we look at those people struggling as the victims. Or we look down with pity. And they are in a much better condition than we are. The one who struggles so much, according to our religious teachings, will have an equivalent amount of reward. The more struggle suffering, the more reward they will have with God. So these people will achieve, because we believe in levels in paradise. The highest level in paradise, while the one who is living in his villa all his life, might barely enter through the gates of paradise. We're not saying that if you're living lavish, you're not going there. Everybody has a chance. But the struggle of those people equates is equal and will be rewarded accordingly. So we have our own, uh, I would say, short-sighted understanding of their situation. And we're not encouraging the you know, continue, continuity of this type of suffering. But don't think someone who died in this manner that they're a lost case. Because we believe in the life to come. And it's all about the life to come. So if you struggle all your life and you go to paradise, you have succeeded. And if you enjoy your whole life and go to hell, you have failed. So don't look at it in such a superficial way. The struggle of these were the, the human beings is meant to be. It is ordained. It is part of the process. It is part of the test. So those who strive and struggle will earn paradise and those who turn away and ignore will earn their spot in the hellfire we seek refuge with god from that yeah. so um some of the more relevant questions is if you were to compare all religions and specifically christianity and islam they share the same fundamentals and basis and each preach similar teachings and have some scientific evidence that prove them so which religion should we follow when they are all almost the same? And why Islam and why Christianity? Uh, key word is almost the same. And we, Islam, Islam acknowledges from a textual point of view that the closest people in so many ways to Islam are the Christians. No doubt. Yes, we share a lot of the fundamentals. But then again, a lot of the fund fundamentals, not all of the fundamentals. If we were to look at the pure teachings of Jesus and the pure teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, then you're looking at technically the same thing, which is actually identical to the teachings of Moses and David and Solomon and Abraham and Noah and Adam and all the prophets which God sent. They all had the same unified universal message that had to do with Creed, the belief system. Of course, the rules differ de depending on their environments. So no doubt, no doubt, there's a lot in common. But the fundamental difference between Islam and Christianity is the most critical. While it is one, you might say, okay, I can see a lot of similarities, but one fundamental difference is Jesus. We say that is actually in Islam, the fine line between belief and disbelief. Because it has to do with God. So we cannot make a blanket statement. We have to sit down with this Christian, whoever that Christian is, on an individual level, say, what do you believe about Jesus? Who is Jesus to you? And you'll find Christians differing a great deal, which is cool. It's fine. They will have their own individual opinions. And then you follow these. There you go. What happened? Sorry for that. It's okay. The squirrel died. No, oh, this one. Oh. <laughs> you're good, you're good. All right. You guys remember the bloopers with the mic before? No. Actually, this one, keep it. Keep it? That's right. The squirrel is alive. It's a funny looking thin man. Is this real hair? <laughs> supposed to match my beard or something? What was I saying? Yeah, so we will hear him out. 
And then we say what it boils down to is, do you believe that there's, that God is anything but one God? And in the simplest sense, meaning if you say one God, but that God is manifested in Father, Son, Holy Ghost, or that Jesus is the embodiment of God in human form, or that Jesus is the Son of God, or Jesus is one of the three in the triune God entity, the Father, Son, Holy. Once you go into that route, we as Muslims say, step on the brakes and time out. We, don't th we, we cannot go in this route. This route in our perception is blasphemy. As per the teachings of Jesus himself, let alone the Islamic teachings, that you should only have the first commandment. Hear, uh, hear O Israel. Huh? What is it? The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment. This is Islam in one sentence. We live by this rule. So when you find a Christian who agrees with the statement without trying to add to Jesus' statement, what he didn't say, don't tell me Paul, don't tell me the church, don't tell me, I don't know, I don't care about those individuals with all due respect. I care about what Jesus said himself. And if you go into cite another Jesus quote from the Bible that contradicts the previous first commandment, then I say now we have a contradiction. And I struggle with contradictions. So now I have an issue with the authenticity of this source. So I take you back to the Quran. So we go back in the same circle, which is going back to the one revelation that human beings have not been able to change. The Quran is the only one that passes that test. So yes, Christians are very close, but they need to, they need to, as far as we're concerned, simply modify one thing. It's like a software update. Huh? If you're an Android user, this is the marshmallow. If you're an iOS user, then keep biting the apple. I'm sorry, I had to squeeze that one in. I work for Samsung, so I'm excused. So, <laughs> so the, the, you have to have a software update, which is just remove Jesus from the divine entity into the messengership. That's it. Believe that Jesus was the messenger of God. He was born miraculously. He, was, he did miracles in the name of Allah. We believe in all of that. It's in the Quran. And then, obviously, if you believe in Jesus, then you shouldn't reject the messenger who came after him that told you about him as well. So then you add the Prophet Muhammad to the list of prophets and messengers you believe in. Once you have these two, then we're on the same page. But you will not find this to be the case. When we have that discussion I mentioned to you earlier, this is where we're going to get into some conflict. No, no, wait. I, I, cannot, I cannot accept Muhammad as a prophet. Nor can I reject the idea that Jesus was the Son of God, or Jesus was God. And then now that is the biggest difference in the world. While we agree on other things, that difference it cannot be resolved. Now, because it's fundamental. Okay, thank you. Awesome. You're welcome, sir. The next lecture, who is God? Yeah, of course. Yeah, advertising, the next lecture, who is God? Yes. We'll speak about that too, inshallah. Okay. So, um, the more relevant questions now. The question says, if you have accepted what is in your fitrah and you believe in one God and you believe in Islam, then why do people still debate of the right and why don't they accept the truth? Beautiful. Because God gave us free will. We're, nothing is imposed on you, safe. Be safe, huh? <laughs> nothing is imposed on you. Every human being has a free will and that is part of the process. If we didn't have the free will, then there will be no purpose behind our existence to begin with. Those who have been meant to go to paradise will be in paradise, and those who are meant to go to hell will be in hell. But God gave us the free will to make the choices. Because we have a free will, we have the people rejecting what we believe is the truth. So again, to give you an example you can relate to, the professor in your class, if he didn't give you the free will, if you didn't have the free will to reject anything he says, then there will never be a conflict in the class. In fact, there will be no point in having a class. Just take the book, study it, and move on with your life. Why is there an event where you have a debate or a dialogue 
or a role play where people present their own ideas and then they, there's a rebuttal. Why is that necessary? Because this is how human beings function. That, that's the free will. The will to reject what someone else presents. Even if it's the truth and yours is false, no doubt, you still have the free will. Because of this free will, we have this issue. But then again, if we didn't have the free will, it'd be a waste of time. So it's from the wisdom of God that He gave us a free will. And He gave us the ability to distinguish between the truth and the falsehood, between the right and the wrong. A lot of them are, are already there by default. They're built in. And some are acquired with your experience in life. Like we said, no one, if you saw a man grab a cat and twist its neck and kill it. I know that's so vicious, huh? Why, why is this repulsive to you? Did you read it in a book? Or your parents taught you when you were young? Listen, when you grow up and you see someone break the neck of a cat, this is wrong, Baba. You're like, aha, uh -huh, yeah, my dad told me this 20 years ago. No! No, and even if you were two years old and you saw someone doing this to the cat, you're going to be like, why? You will cry. You will cry for the cat. Why is this wrong? Because you already know by default. This is something you know by default, it's right and wrong. God gave us a free will. It's, it's, a beautiful, it's a beautiful concept. I like it. Not that anyone cares what I like, but I'm just saying. <laughs> Next. Oh, you're still waiting. So I was like, what happened? The question's over. I've just received a very interesting question. It says, okay, I agree with what you're saying. Oh, beautiful. What now? What now? What now? Let's have dinner. <laughs> <laughs> it's on safe. No, what now? <laughs> well, it really depends on how much you agree and what you mean. I mean, what now? What now is submit. When you have found the truth, you submit. When you have learned something, you put it into practice. So if there's a, you learn how to be a firefighter, right? And then you took the course and you're certified and you're a certified firefighter and there's a fire in front of you and you're standing there with the hose and you're just smiling. <laughs> Man, the people are burning. Ah. I know, I'm certified. Yes, yeah, use it. No, no, no. Let me think about it some more. Get out of my face and bring a real firefighter. So if you've figured it all out, what are you waiting for? L let me die first. Then I will do something about it. It'll be too late. How many mics am I going to use today? This is an ugly mic. That's a better mic. So if you have really reached that point, Please, come on in. Huh? And we're all here to help you. If, you. if you want to feel at home with a big family of multicolored and multinational people, then Muslims are the ultimate audience. They're, you know, from every background, every race, every whatever you think of. And we don't have, we're not supposed to have any discrimination within our religion, even though some human beings or individuals are, are racist in their nature. And from a religious point of view, we're all equal before God. The only good people are the righteous people. This is what distinguishes the, the better person versus the bad person. Only their relationship with God, their God consciousness, nothing else. So, you know, we as a big family would love to have you and, you know, help you through the first steps, inshallah. Ask them. I mean, I've been depressed in my life, but I didn't reach that point. The worst I've gotten was Buddhism. And I don't mean it in any bad way. But in terms of, to me, being alienated from, from the truth was, you know, I mean, again, with no offense to anyone, but I just look back at my life. How many hours did I spend behind what they call a Butsanon? Again, Buddhism is not just one form of Buddhism. There were different denominations. The one I belong to, that school of Buddhism, had to do with chanting Nam Yo Ho Renge Kyo. I don't know if there's any Buddhist here who knows what I'm saying. But Wallahi, by God, we spent hours, endless hours in front of a Butsinan. That's what they called it. Okay, You can Google all this stuff. Ask Google, don't ask me. It's called a Butsinan and we would spend hours going Nam Yo Ho Renge Kyo, Nam Yo Ho Renge Kyo for like hours. Why? Because we were changing our karma. Because I had smoked a blunt 
you know, a couple of hours earlier, and uh, that's pretty bad. So if I, my karma is negative now, so if I die in the reincarnation process, I will come as a cockroach or as an ant or as a rat, and that's not cool. So how do I fix that? This is what we were taught. You know, it's not my ideology, but that's the one I was working with because that's the, the, the rappers I was hanging, hanging out with were like that. And my, my uh, compass was off, you know. I guess I was too oblivious to things and I just did this for years. Thinking that this is going to change the karma. Now I look back and say, really? How many hours I could have been, you know, exercising maybe or doing something more beneficial than chanting Nam Yoho Renge Gyo to fix my karma? But, you know, at the end of the day, that's just what happened. What was the question again? <laughs> no, I'm serious. How do people turn from their to Yeah, their yeah, so that's how. Uh, that's how they do it. In my case, that's how I did it. I was into uh, uh, art, into music. The people I was hanging out with who were in the same music you know, department, I would say, were of that religion. And I simply conformed to that because it was the most convenient thing. That's just one way. A peer pressure, you call it peer pressure. Or just not really thinking about things a lot, just being submissive. Being submissive to anything that is out there. Or it could be a depression, a calamity that, stri that you know, strikes someone and they can't cope with it. So they wind up leaving God. But you know, if you truly understood God, and that would be, I guess, a focal point in my lecture, inshallah. I'll try to highlight this the most because I think it's the, the biggest misconception. The existence of all this evil while God exists, you know? How do, we, how do we correlate between these two facts? If the people understood this well, if they knew the wisdom behind why things happen in this world, then they wouldn't have this negative attitude towards God that would lead them to rejecting Him in totality. They would learn how to cope with it. But those who don't have training, who lack that training, then the easiest option is, you know what? There's no way there's a God when this event happened. So the easiest option is, I don't want to believe in God. Give me something else. But you know, you know in life, if you choose the easiest option, you, will, you might gain some now, but you will fail down the line. Anytime you're presented with a difficult alternative and an easy one, 99% the easy one will serve you for a short period, but the one you abandoned was the one that was good for you in the long run. Ask people who are, you know, do I just get a bachelor's degree or do I continue and get my master's? What is the easiest option? Huh? Quit school now. Forget about the bachelor's degree too, man. Let me just make, let me make some money, start my own business. But you will find more often than not, people who say, you know what, bachelor's is good enough. At some point in life, they will come across an event where they say, if you had a master's degree, man, you'd be making double the salary. And you're like, oh. I should have done it. You know, you chose the easy option, that's cool for you. But down the line, it's almost never good. So yeah, you can say I don't believe in God, that's the easy option. But is it gonna help you when you die? No. So think harder about it, you know. Try to cope with what happened and don't let that calamity or depression lead you to rejecting God altogether. Okay. You You're Basically, welcome, sir. Um, the person who has asked what's next will be around on campus, so whenever you feel like coming and speaking to him, just let us know or find him there, find him in the booth, if you have any booth in the SA circle, so just come there and find him, you can speak to him more in trouble. Yeah, but wait a second, that if I die, it doesn't mean that there's no next for you. Huh? So I was going to become a Muslim, but the guy died, so I guess it's a sign from God. No, I'll just take him, no, 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 if I'm around, that's fantastic, if I'm not around, you don't need me, right? Um, if just my presence or absence have nothing to do with what's next for you. I think it's given you a convenient option, eh? easy access. But actually any Muslim will be able to help you. Even if you're on your own, you know, you'll be able to manage. But this is just an option available to you. Don't make it conditional to your next step or not. Thank you, Muslim. Thank you, Saif. That was very safe, by the way. <laughs> so the next question says, how do you let your heart speak amongst the distractions of the world. How do you let your heart what? Speak amongst the distractions of the world. Your heart speaks? <laughs> I'm interested in hearing that. I, I'm, I'm guessing you mean something else. 
I mean, how do you let your heart see maybe through the distractions? You should be able to focus, I guess, on the spiritual aspect. It's a challenge and it becomes more difficult with the passage of time. But it, it boils down to one fundamental belief that you have and that is the duration of this worldly life versus the life to come as the Prophet Muhammad explained, may Allah exalt his mention, is like you dipping your finger in an ocean and then pulling it back out. How much do you get? A droplet of water. This droplet of water is the worldly life and the hereafter is the ocean. So when you look at these two, I think you can't really go wrong. And it, it's not, it's easily said, right? Easy said, not easy done. Uh, not that, that, that easy to implement. But once you have understood the concept and you work on internalizing it, then slowly but surely you, you reach that point where you know where to focus and prioritize. It's a challenge that we all go through, but that's for sure. This question says, from your lecture I can see that you are a creationist and rejects the theory of evolution. Correct? Yes, sir. Okay. I have one simple question. How old is planet Earth and how old is the universe? I don't care. <laughs> With all due respect, okay, let me tell you, it's 14 million and 255 days and 33 minutes and 6 seconds. All right, evolution exists. What does that have to do with anything? What does that have to do with anything? Where do we have to identify the age of earth or planet to believe whether we came from a monkey or not? And evolution, Darwinism, has been rejected even scientifically. I mean, religions have been rejecting it forever, but there are serious flaws. And if you don't know, then I'm sorry, you need another software update. <laughs> because you're completely oblivious to facts. Nowadays, this is no longer the opinion of a minority. Scientifically speaking, and search it on your own, Darwinism is rejected tooth and nail. We believe in evolution as Muslims, meaning things evolve after God created them. Surely the giraffe might have a longer neck because it needed to reach out for something after so many years. And human beings shrunk. We believe we were much taller, much bigger. And we continue to shrink. Otherwise you wouldn't fit in your car. That's pretty cool. But you know, that doesn't reject the concept of evolution. But to believe that human beings came from apes and evolved into this, then we say this is where the issue is. And I'm sorry, maybe I'm ignorant but i don't see how answering the question of the how old is earth is going to resolve this question does anyone see the relation between the two enlighten me if we have identified the age of universe so what okay i guess you agree good Alcohol is prohibited. Why is alcohol prohibited even in small amounts? There is no intoxicating effect. I'm sure they wrote this while they were a little tipsy. <laughs> no, well, you know what? Actually, it's interesting you say this because Islam does have an observation and opinion regarding this concept of the amount. The amount does make a difference Islamically. And it's a jurisprudence or jurisprudential difference that I'm not going to elaborate on as not to confuse you. But let's just assume the one position. There are two positions. Let's assume that alcohol, regardless of the amount, okay, or the uh, percentage within an item, a larger item, is not allowed. You're saying that if it's in small amounts and it doesn't get you intoxicated, what's the problem? The problem is not in that. The problem is that human beings need a general rule that everyone can follow, right? And then exceptions exist. Otherwise, if you don't have this general rule and you leave it so open, then it can be misused as often as you like. So if we didn't have this regulation, then how do you judge that you drank so much until you got intoxicated? How does, you, you know, you keep trying, so you get one, two, three, four, five, then he's saying, uh, I 
think I'm drunk. Let me, let me drink some more. Oh, by the time you're walking around like a maniac and your friends are trying to put you in the car, you realize, okay, 11 bottles is what it takes. I mean, really, you're going to leave it open like this for everybody to have his own way? No, he says, close this door. Just close this door. Alcohol, keep it out. Why? Alcohol is a disaster. How many crimes? How many people have killed their parents? How many people have killed innocent people while they're drunk? We cannot even enumerate them. Countries, big countries, Western countries, at some point try to stop. They try to prohibit alcoholism and alcohol consumption, making it illegal. It didn't work because they realized the impact. They realize the impact. People do things when they're drunk that they will never do when they're sober. Never even consider doing when they're sober. From molestation to incest to things that you cannot even speak about in a public event like this. Because of a person being intoxicated. So Islam realizes the danger of intoxication and just put you know, tight shackles on it. So that human beings can function in a sober state. You know, you want to enjoy certain things? Then... Drink fruits. <laughs> yeah? Pineapple juice, orange juice, mango juice. You know, all this stuff is good. And it doesn't get you drunk. And it's unsafe. <laughs> Sorry, safe. He's like, I'm quitting this. This is the last year. Since our mind is one of the lessons to use in our search and research for true religion, and we were born with our natural disposition to believe in God. What about saying that the concept of God that children understand doesn't tally with, the, with that understood they developed minds? Sure, sure, no doubt. In everything in life, your concept of that thing as a child versus now changed. My son, uh, Mu'adh, may Allah bless him, he has this habit now. I don't know how he... I don't know if he's bluffing us or... I don't know. But he's six years old. And he, every time something happens, he says, Baba, when I was four years old, I used to think when you guys were saying such and such and such, it meant this. Like, you know, for example, we had one in, in, in my past. <laughs> I knew people who believed when they watched TV that the people were in the TV. That these human beings were small creatures in the television. And that if you open the back, you can pull out the actor. Hey, James Bond, I'll show you what's up. <laughs> Kill that guy, step on him like a roach. They truly believed that, you know, all the things they were watching on TV were people that living, they're living in the TV. They didn't understand the concept. Now they grow up and say, hey, how stupid was that? I say, well, that's what you believed. So, I mean, of course, when you speak to a child, it's not going to have the same perception as a developed uh, a human being has but the bottom line is what we're trying to prove is that it is there by nature by naturally it's naturally existent they're not going to elaborate or be sophisticated about it we're only trying to prove its existence and that its non-existence is almost seldom or rare that's all but what God is who God is will definitely change year year by year let alone when you study theology then you have a whole other concept and understanding of God which you didn't have even before you studied theology at the age of 30, let alone when you were young. So yeah, this is a common sense, inshallah. Okay, um, last three questions. So if you still have any questions. Okay. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I have a question. When uh, we as Muslims, we worship the one true God, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But why, when I read the uh, translation, he refers himself as the. Do you understand? Yeah, I understand. Yeah, because uh, it's a very simple question, simple answer actually. It's a very good question, but uh, there's a very simple answer, which is the linguistic concept of we. Uh, ready? So, in English, and Arabic is similar to English in some ways and different in other ways, but in English, when you use the different pronouns for singular and plural, do they always refer to a number or are there variations? Linguistically speaking, a person, one individual, can refer to themselves as we from the royal perspective. So the Queen of England, until today, she could be talking about herself, they would say we. 
such and such and such. So the concept we doesn't always have to do with numbers or the multiplicity of, of one entity. The Arabic language is, is in line with English in this regard. So Nahnu, we, is not referring to many gods. It is that royal majestic we that belongs to the one and only God. Now, for you to understand that, so there will be no controversy or no contradiction within the Quran, this is what the Quran already explained, that there are verses that are ambiguous in nature, they are open to many interpretations, and there are other verses that are clear cut. So whenever you have a conflict, what appears to be conflict to you, you use that which is clear cut, explain, and you understand the ambiguous in the light of the clear cut. So the clear cut ayah is what? قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٌ Say it is Allah who is one and unique. That's it. So now you have to understand everything else in the light of this particular ayah. And linguistically this is completely normal. Meaning the disbelievers at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, the idol worshippers, the, the polytheists, had this been an argument, it would have been raised way back. You know, but they, their argument was different. They never argued about the issue of we because linguistically this was known to everybody. This we is never referring to plural plurality of God. It's one singular God, but the linguistic plural, the royal, the royal plural, yes. I'm not in a position, no human being is in a position to pass such a judgment. This is a judgment that God already passed. And we as human beings have the right to relay and convey what has already been decided by God. However, this is all pertaining to the existing life and everything is changeable. Meaning you cannot say to someone, you're going to hell. Because no one knows what's going to happen in a second, let alone in a minute, an hour, a day, a week, a year, so forth. We say generally, whosoever disbelieves in God, because there's a day of judgment where God is the judge, and because we believe He created heaven and hell, and He will place those who have believed in Him and followed His way in paradise and the other ones in hell, according to God, the, He made this judgment, and this is all pending, TBD, to be determined by Him on the day of judgment. We don't have the right to say this to anyone. We just say, according to the rules, if you do this, you cannot tell the student you're going to fail. But you can say, look, according to the professor, no homework, you missed three classes in the semester, you're out. You have the right to say this. He cannot argue, say, who are you to tell me? Hey man, I'm not the one coming up with the rule, but that's what the professor said, and I have the right to say this to you. Can't be mad at me for conveying what he said. You have a problem, go to the professor. Tell him, why, why are you making three? Three strike rule. I should be able to miss five classes. Then you can now negotiate with the professor. Similarly, anyone from among human beings who doesn't like this, say, what's up with that man? Paradise, hell, I'm gonna, God is going to put me whatever. No problem. I'm not going to fight with you. Tell that to God on the Day of Judgment. You have every right to tell Him on the Day of Judgment you were displeased with His decisions. But then don't, don't come talk to me, tell me, hey, can you help me out? Because I know you were trying to offer me help in the worldly life and I rejected you. I need your help now. Sorry. Now we were available to make it happen now and you didn't like it. No problem. You have the free will to reject. But on that day, don't talk to nobody. Don't ask for paradise. It's an easy option for everyone. And the great news is we're not responsible. Other Muslims, other, we're not responsible. It's not our responsibility. We just convey the message as we believe it was revealed. Then you have the right to accept or reject. I don't have the right to send you to hell or send myself to paradise. You can wind up in paradise and I can wind up in hell. It's none of my business. What we say is we try to be good, to go to paradise and avoid being bad, to avoid hell. And every human being should do the same. The judgment belongs to Allah on the day of judgment. But don't trick yourself into, well, you know, I'm going to make the decision now without being man enough to stand up for it on the day of judgment. You can be brave now, but remember you will need that bravery then. You should be equally brave to stand before God on the day of judgment and say, I wasn't happy with your system.
And then we, ha we will only watch. We will only watch. We, we, can't do, we can't intercede, intercede, we can't interfere. We can't do anything about it, nothing about it. So if you're man or woman enough to deal with it on that day, your decision is yours now. But as a human being advising you, don't go there. Because believe me, and believe your inner self, it's going to happen. There is a day of judgment. There is accountability. There are people that will be punished for the wrongdoing they did in this life. How are you going to kill all these people? How are you going to bomb all these people? How are you going to have World War I and II and III? How is Hitler going to get away with all these crimes and then he just dies? He puts a bullet in his head or someone kills him and that's it? All the suffering he caused to multitudes of human beings is going to go unnoticed? He just ran away with it? And the person who struggled in his life and was given charity, he will also die and get nothing out of it? Come on. That is so unfair. Unfair that this guy committed so many crimes and got away with it. And this person did so good and he got nothing. That is impossible. Impossible. Because of that, there has to be justice. There has to be accountability. There has to be a reward system. Incentive. Nothing else makes sense. No matter how much we play around with it, nothing else makes sense. So think about that and prepare yourself for that big day. I, I think we're done. We have one more question. <laughs> so uh, the question says, sorry, this is actually asking for your content. Really? But is there any way, a proper channel for us to ask you questions, such as your email address or your Facebook, etc.? Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll make a small advertisement if it's allowed. Uh, such a nice guy, huh? I pretend to be a nice guy right now at least. Yeah, well, say, uh, Facebook, uh, I have a Facebook, what do they call it, public uh, figure type of thing. Uh, so if you are interested in lectures and, and religious talks, then uh, there's one way to paradise. The Facebook page is called One Way to Paradise. Uh, email, you can also contact me at onewaytoparadise at gmail.com. But in all honesty, I hate typing emails. I have a keyboard here, but I hate typing. So I prefer that you WhatsApp me because I like to talk a lot. So you can type out your biography and I will leave a 10 second voice message and everybody's happy, right? So if, if anyone's interested, somehow you can find my number on, people have Googled it. I don't know how they found it from LinkedIn or something. Some way, somehow, everyday people discover the number and they get in touch with me. And I'm, I, I answer whatever, whether it's a Muslim, non-Muslim, I don't care, I don't discriminate. I answer to the best of my ability via WhatsApp. It's my preferred uh, channel of communication. Way better than uh, Gmail or uh, email. In, I'm sorry, I'm no, supporting Google again. Way better than email in, in general. So, uh, yeah, if you want later, you can, I'll give you my number, no problem. It's not a, not a big deal. You can contact me at, at your convenience. But, 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 sorry. <laughs> you, before you contact me on WhatsApp, Please watch my latest lecture, What's Up with WhatsApp, where I explain the etiquettes of using WhatsApp. Because if you don't follow the etiquettes of WhatsApp, my hair will grow. You see, I don't like that. I'm trying to maintain a clean, bald head. And some people just drive you crazy. Just a quick example. Hi, one message. My, one message. Name, one message. Is Ahmed. And my phone was sitting there and I heard, bip, bip, bip. I'm like, oh, someone died. Someone died. My name is Ahmed. Ahmed, brother, come on, man. Send one message, ya sheikh. You can't control yourself from pressing enter after you put every word. Even the punctuation is in a sentence on its own, question mark. And then you read the message, it's a blue tick. And you were in a business meeting. huh? Two minutes later, three question marks. What's up with you, man? You read my message, you didn't answer. Oh, sorry, master. I didn't know I was enslaved to answer you on the spot. So I have a lot of struggles with WhatsApp because of people not following the etiquette. So that lecture explains how human beings, Muslims specifically, and human beings in general should use mannerism in using WhatsApp. It'll be a beautiful world, and I'll be more than happy to help you. But, you know, just, just uh, yeah, take that into consideration, please. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, so thank you very much.
more yeah, Sheikh, and every time you say this is the end of it, then you come up with a question. This is called false advertisement. I can sue you for this. <laughs> Go ahead, it's okay. We're nice people. Let it slide. So, um, let's try to start with. Okay, this question says, if there is such hard, harsh accountability on the day of judgment, then why is there, in brackets, harsh Sharia law? Why pay twice? Ah, it's a very good question. Actually, we have explicit text that says whoever pays for their sin in this worldly life, they are no longer responsible for it on the day of judgment. So it's not paying twice. If you violate a law, and there's an excuse me, sisters, and there's an Islamic regulation regarding that penal code regarding that law. Once you have paid for it now, you are no longer responsible for it on the Day of Judgment. You've paid once. You will not pay twice. If you get away with it in this worldly life, then still on the Day of Judgment, you have one of two situations. Either God can pardon you because He pardons. He, forgive, he loves to forgive. He might forgive one of us even though we didn't pay for it. Or we might do good deeds that will erase this bad deed. Or we might be hit with a calamity that is so severe that it removes the burden of this previous sin or whatever it is, all of this now remains pending on the day of judgment. So no way you will pay twice. No way you will pay twice. You. Unless you're going for dinner and Saif is paying. In which case, he will pay twice. <laughs> Sorry, Saif. It's fine. So this question says, and from your experience, how is, how is, okay. how is Buddhism different from Islam? Well, honestly, uh, in, in my humble opinion, again, because you, you may disagree, it's about the complete way of life. I mean, I just, from my, my uh, interaction with Christians, having Christian family members, uh, my interaction with Buddhists, being a, a part of Buddhism at some point in my life, not the wildest Buddhist in the world, but still, I was practicing that religion. And you know, in, in giving propagation to Islam, you come across different people from different religions, different ideologies. The one fundamental difference I find always and forever is that Islam is a complete way of life. Uh, where, whereas other religions might address certain elements of our life, you know, livelihood, but they don't give you a complete solution. They're not, they're a quick fix for some things, but they don't give you that uh, medication that will help you eradicate any type of disease. Islam is there to you know, resolve the, the sickness of the heart, the sickness of the body, it, regarding your physical being, regarding your relationship with others, with your parents, with your you know, siblings, with your spouses, with your children, with the society. In everything, there's a rule and regulation based on, uh, you know, based on logic. We see it, at least, of course, to us it's logical. You may disagree. Based on logic, based on uh, benevolence based on compassion there are some exceptions because they are subjective to the people's opinions but by by large you know that for the for the most part people agree so that islam gives you a way to re relate to your creator and a way to relate to the creation and it gives you a complete i would say um map you know a map with specific instructions for you to follow to make it to your destination. It doesn't tell you, look, this is point A, this is point B, figure it out. You know, figure it out on your own. Go wherever you want to go in the process. No, that's cool sometimes, but most people get lost. We got lost on the way from the airport until we pulled out Google Maps. And then, you know, I call her Patricia. Patricia came into the picture, you know, in 200 meters, keep right at the fork. And then she doesn't sound like this, obviously, she sounds a little softer. But Patricia helped us get to the destination. So we need detailed instruction. Now, when Google Maps gives you direction, if you took a different route, does that mean you're lost? You, lo you will no longer make it to the destination? No, it will reroute. We missed the U-turn, we missed the exit. Now it will reroute and say, okay, now make a U-turn here, come back. It will now continue, continue to help you get to your destination. So in our map, Islam is the map. It gives you that complete instructions. You might go off track sometimes, but we have solutions for that as well. If you divert from the path, you repent and you get back on track. You don't just get lost and say, well, you're doomed to hell. Others, we, I, don't, I have not seen a religion which gives you that kind of map. In fact, 
for many religions, you don't even know where the beginning point is. Because I say the beginning point is knowing who God is. And if you cannot explain to the people who God is adequately, that means there's something wrong in your understanding of God. If you have to explain so many complicated things that the people can't fathom, can't understand, three in, anything that is you know, unusual, dogmatic, then we say this is even the, the initiation point, the starting point is ambiguous. But in Islam, we know the exact starting point, we can explain it very effectively, I would say. We know the destination point, we have instructions and everything. And even when we go off the track, we have solutions for that. That's, that to me, Islam, what, what it offers versus others, with all due respect to everybody, not, not trying to be offensive in any way. No. Okay, the last question. No, this would be the last question for you. <laughs> Except if someone has a question. Quote him for this, huh? It's okay, you can ask more questions. I'm teasing you, man. We have nothing to do, right? Yeah, till the morning. Yeah, I'm lecture till the morning. Okay. Anyhow, the last question says Can a woman be imam during prayers? What? <laughs> can a woman be a man during prayer? Imam, imam. Imam? Oh. Yeah, you should translate that to, to English right away. Because I heard, Can a woman be a man in prayer? <laughs> I'm like, dang, this is the worst time to choose that. He said Imam. <laughs> imam is like a position, right? Like a leader. So can a woman be a leader in prayer? Of course. When she's leading herself. <laughs> and or when she's leading other women. But if a woman is going to lead men, then really? I mean, come on, do I have to? Let, let me break it down. Can I break it down? Let me break it down. So in our prayer, we bow and prostrate now I'll talk to the men over here when you see them young ladies walking on campus and you your binoculars automatically are in full focus what do you check out no man let's just be real I don't like this all sugar coating all this bluffing nonsense every man here knows what's up there are items which you identify and judge accordingly pass Fail. Ah, she can fix this a little bit. Now we as Muslims are commanded to lower the gaze just for the ladies' peace of mind. We are supposed to lower our gaze to the best of our ability. We're men, we're weak. This is our weakness. Women are the weakness of men. So if we, if we are lowering the gaze, we don't have an issue. If we don't, or even the first look, with that first look, you've done all of the above, which I mentioned right now. So now how are you going to tell me a lady is going to bow in front of me in prayer and I'm going to be focusing on God? Like what, what, where is the logic in that? For those who want to push this type of feminism within the boundaries of Islam. We say this is honestly illogical because it goes against the nature of man. Or a woman praying next to me. You know, if, if men and women were standing in one row together, you know, and you, this is how we pray. There are elbows. Come on now. Come on now, you can't just, these are things that conflict with the spiritual state you're trying to achieve. Your, your mind and focus should not be on the young lady now, should be on your creator. So I mean, logically speaking, no way on earth this would be, you know, feasible. It's, it's, it's illogical. And if you open that door, then you will destroy. This is how religions were destroyed. Because the people want to become flexible and they want to change. And to the point that... Now, you know, the same religions which were against certain things have now become the propagators of these things because of social pressures and so on and so forth. So we say, no, no, this is a red line. You know, we stand in prayer, men lead the prayer, then other men are behind them, and then the ladies are behind. That is the most logical setup for everyone to pray. Afterwards, they can get married. If, if this is what's on their mind, you, you like the lady, go ask for her hand from her father, get married, have kids, have fun. But th there shouldn't be anything beyond that, you know? And again, this goes all stems from the idea that men were prophets. All prophets were men. Because that leadership requires that type of, you know, the man has certain traits that the woman may not have. And for sure, women have traits that we don't have. That are better than us. No matter how much you try as a man to be like, a woman in certain areas, you will fail. And we say to the ladies, same goes for you. If you're a religious leader and you're on your monthly period, then what's up now? 
Oh, I can't lead the prayer. Why? Because during menstruation, women in Islam are not supposed to pray. So how is the religion going to function now with the absence of this lady? She got pregnant. The Prophet is going to be on vacation for nine months. For, I mean, it just doesn't make sense. It just doesn't add up. So God made it in such a way where men have a role, women have a role, and each, there's mutual rights between them, and there's obligations for both of them, and each is entitled to paradise. It's not about now putting down any gender versus the other. It's about knowing our roles. You know, you're a professor in class, and you're a student in class. Don't try to be the professor. He doesn't have to be the student. Not that anyone is better. That student can become better than a professor. But at this point, you have different roles. You want to mix and match with the roles, nothing will work in this life. So it's a very, you know, it's a, it's a direct thing, I, I believe. That's why women, you know, cannot be an imam with other men in salah. Okay, thank you, Mosul. You're welcome, I sir. We will, I will give you the chance to conclude, please. I have concluded, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so if Mosul has concluded, <laughs> I would like to extend my warmest uh, appreciation for your time. Thank you, sir. And I really thank you, everyone, brothers and sisters, for bearing the heat. Because I have, we, we've tackled this issue with the state office, and unfortunately, they couldn't solve it. But I hope so. God willing, after the lectures from tomorrow and after, will be better. So thank you very much for bearing this with us. And uh, thank you very much for listening and uh, you know, being engaging in the questions and answers. And I hope to see you tomorrow. And I hope also to see you in Abu Musa's next lecture on Thursday, which is Who is God? I think he has referred to it many times. So yes. it's on Tuesday, same venue, same timing. And thank you very much. Exactly. Have a good night. So for the, for the Muslim friends, basically we're going to go pray Aisha after 15 minutes. So if you'd like to join us, I